morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Database Professionals Virtual Meetup Group. Um, I'm Julie Bloomquist, and I'm the moderator today, along with um, Weston and uh, Paresh. Uh, this is the information on how you can reach us. Um, send us emails, look at us on LinkedIn, uh, formerly Twitter. Uh, if you want to speak or have a suggestion, go ahead and uh, send us an email, and we'd love to have feedback. Our meetings are the second Wednesday noon and Eastern time and the fourth Wednesday noon Pacific time. So these are a, a lunch and learn uh, educational opportunity. And here's the tiny URL. We do post our recordings up uh, to our YouTube channel, and this is where it will be uh, posted. Uh, Wesson has given us permission uh, to do the posting or to record today's presentation. Here are future sessions which are coming along. Um, uh, we've got some great topics uh, through the end of the year. The PASS Data Community Summit is November 4th through the 8th, again in Seattle. That's coming up. It's a premier educational opportunity or conference for SQL Server. It's just a wonderful event. And uh, Here's some more information about it. Uh, it's industry leaders uh, and it's pastdatacommunitysummit.com. And if you'd like to attend uh, and you use data prof VMG 150, you'll get $150 off your registration. Uh, we have, uh, this is all about future events with SQL Saturday and Data Saturdays. These are one day mini conferences throughout the world. So here's some that are coming up. And uh, a shout out to the SQL Saturday Boston. Paresh used to be up in the Boston area. So he's been active uh, with that group for a long time. Theirs is uh, October 5th. So but, you can uh, actually club it with a couple of days off here and there and go visit the mountains for the foliage. This is by far the best time to visit New England, so. Go on your leaf tours, look at the colors. And uh, today uh, we want to thank Weston Goodwin. Uh, it's going to be talking about SQL simulator and simulate your SQL commands without executing against SQL Server. Once again, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So I'm going to stop sharing and Weston, you should be able to share now. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. Um, let's see here. And uh, how are you taking questions, Weston? Can we just let them know as and when they yeah, get the questions, just, right? Yeah, just uh, put your questions into the chat and we'll be uh, stopping, you know, as the questions come in, Parash, you know, like in between the slides or the, the topic areas, uh, we, we can shout out with questions. And I can see your screen fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so uh, simulate SQL commands without executing them against the database. All right, my name is Weston Goodwin. Uh, I'm the creator of a tool called SQL Simulator. I've been a software developer for almost 30 years. Um, a lot of that time has been doing Power Builder. Uh, I live in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm married with technically three children. And then you're like, well, okay, technically three. How does that work? So um, I have a uh, sister who is 17 years younger than me. And when our mother died in 2011, I got custody of her. And um, so my wife and I had no children. And then in 2011, we had two. So we had my sister who was 13 at the time. And then uh, my son, uh, they were, you know, so that was just kind of a crazy time. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. Um, again, I'm gonna talk about the SQL simulator. What is it? I'll talk a little bit about why I created it. And then uh, we'll go through the demo and um, um, as well, All right? So uh, what is SQL Simulator? Uh, it's a Kubernetes app that leverages SQL scripts to generate subsetted databases within a secure sandbox environment. 
There's no need to rewrite SQL statements for testing purposes. The tool automatically constructs and populates the tables, including those with foreign keys, based on common SQL commands such as insert, update, delete, create tables, and select. The most notable feature of SQL Simulator is its self-destruct mechanism. Any databases created by the tool will automatically destroy themselves after 15 minutes of inactivity, enhancing security and resource management. Uh, SQL Simulator incorporates a data governor to regulate data access. This governor imposes restrictions on the number of keys retrievable from tables, both in terms of daily limits and per request quotas. For instance, uh, users can specify limits such as allowing only one, uh, one SSN to be retrieved across all the tables within a database. This ensures data usage compliance and prevents the potential for a massive data breach if you are hacked. Uh, an additional feature of the data governance is called celebrity data. If you mark any key in your database as being celebrity data, this record will need additional approval from management before a user can access it. Okay, so this is a visual representation of how SQL Simulator can allow you to research or test production issues without accessing the, accessing the entire database. In the middle of the screen, you see the word uh, K, K8S cluster. This stands for Kubernetes. This is where all of the databases that you use will be temporarily stored. The blue databases on the right have sensitive data in them. The purple database at the bottom has no sensitive data in it. There's a black database, which is what SQL Simulator uses to determine if you can view the data. The users you see on the extreme left hand of the diagram are not able to connect directly to any of the blue databases which have sensitive data. They are only able to connect to the purple databases directly. Okay, so are there any uh, questions about the uh, previous section? Uh, nothing at this time, but if you could X the little pop-up boxes that says that the recording is in process and just hit the little X on that. Um, I don't see anything like that. Uh, oh, on your screen? Okay, it just says recording and recording and transcript. Okay, it's 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 gone now, but uh, you just need to reshare. Okay. You just see your desktop, but yeah, everything's fine. No questions at this time. All right. Okay. So, um, uh, why did I create it? By the way, did that did that thing pop back up? No, it's gone. Okay. Um, there were a couple of reasons as to why I originally created SQL Simulator. Uh, one was to test database change requests or you know manual updates to production, and the second reason was to make it easy to retest the data multiple times. Um, after I created the initial version of the tool, I talked to several people about it. Uh, the feedback I received was that people were worried about the security of it. Um, though they didn't say it, I'm sure some people were more, more worried about trying software that touches their database from some random guy at a networking event. <laughs> uh, my next thought was, you know, how do I get people to trust me, right? So I decided to join a Microsoft Accelerator program. Um, one of the mentors in the program said that they really liked the concept of uh, what it did and asked if I can make it run into con in containers or run in Kubernetes um, because then it would be available through their app store. Um, so I agreed to do that. Uh, it took a few months um, because trying to get past their security process was an absolute nightmare, uh, but I got it done. And after this, I had a meeting with a former uh, CISO or Chief Information Security Officer about SQL Simulator. Uh, he said that the biggest problem he had was um, was when he was a, a CI, CISO, he said that his developers were making a copy of production and taking it home with them. <laughs> uh, uh, this kind of caught me off guard. I'd never heard of such, a, you know, I never heard of that before. Um, and then he asked me if I had a way to stop that. And um, I told him I didn't because, like, once you give somebody access to data, um, 
you can't stop them to, from doing whatever they want to with it. So about a month after this conversation, I was on my way to a networking event um, when I kind of had an idea. And, um, you, you know, because by this point, my app was working inside of Kubernetes. And I was like, well, and it does, and it does these subset of databases. And I said, well, I can limit, you know, the keys that they have access to. So I can't stop them from taking 100% of the data home, but I can stop like 99.9% .9 of it. So that's kind of a a, a short story of of um, how I how I came up with the tool. Um, another issue I had is um, when you run a SQL against um, like a UAT database or a model office database or production. So uh, and again, going back to these manual updates that you that you do on these databases, you know, you might have a, a SQL script that runs fine. When you run it against dev, um, it may run fine against a UAT database, but then it fails in production. Or you might have something that runs, you know, that doesn't run in a UAT database or a model office database. Um, and so with, and, and, and a lot of places kind of have like um, some type of automation with these scripts. Um, and so this way, if you use this approach, uh, you can make sure that your script is going to run across all the different databases you need to test it out against, or you, you know that you that you have set up. Um, and again, um, you, you know if if I test something, uh, a, a database change request, and I found an issue with my SQL script, it was difficult to reset the database the way it was before I tried the SQL. So I wanted something that would allow me to put my database back to the way it was before I ran my test. Um, are there any questions about the uh, previous uh, section? Nope, you're doing fine. Okay. Uh, so next thing we'll talk about are the benefits of, of using um, of this approach. Okay, uh, so the first thing is that um, this tool will not expose all of your production data. Uh, instead, it gives users access to a very small percentage of production data because you can restrict them to as few as one SSN across all the tables in the database. Um, another business case is to limit the number of SSNs retrieved on a daily basis. Uh, this limit becomes a security feature. For example, uh, let's say you limit everybody to just three SSNs per day. Uh, somebody comes in one day and they can't retrieve any SSNs or they can't build any um, subset of databases. Um, that lets you know that you have an intruder in your system and you can notify the security team and try to remediate the situation. Okay, uh, each state establishes its own threshold for reporting data breaches, uh, and there are variations across all the states. A prudent, a, a prudent benchmark to adhere to is 300. By ensuring that each database generated by SQL Simulator contains no more than one or two SSNs, for example, you can remain below this threshold. It's important to note that individuals affected by a data breach must still be notified although there is no obligation to inform the state or press. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about is the, um, uh, it reduces computing and storage costs for non-production databases uh, because you only need a small percentage of that database or a subset of that database instead of the whole thing. All right, are there any uh, questions about the uh, previous section? No. Okay. All right, so we'll move to the demo part. So uh, we'll talk about the, the scene. So uh, for the demo portion of the webinar, we're going to pretend we work for a Geeko insurance company. Uh, the DBA has set a data governed limit of three SSNs per day with only one SSN that can be retrieved at a time. So uh, the first scenario is you get a call from HR. An employee did not get their paycheck the other day and you need to research to find out why. Through a secure email, you are sent the SSN of 12345689. The first thing we need to do is to create a pod in uh, Kubernetes. A pod can be thought of as similar to a server or a virtual server. The next thing that we will do is upload a SQL script to review the results. The, the results. All right. So. Um, 
Uh, so for those that are unfamiliar with uh, Kubernetes, um, you can basically uh, set up all of the major cloud providers uh, provide a Kubernetes service. Um, so the one I use is uh, Azure. And um, I will show you uh, the first command that you need to enter. Uh, just give me one moment to set this up. And... Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier about Kubernetes has a pods or what you would consider like virtual servers. So in order to access the virtual, the control panel uh, for SQL Simulator, uh, we need to do a port forward. Um, and this is the command to do that. Um, so you have a uh, kubectl port forward, the name of the pod, and in this case, this, or the server name, which is the control panel, and we're going to be using the, the ports of 5000. All right, so I have them saved. Okay, so um, at this screen, this is where you create um, the pods, and the pods will contain a copy of SQL Simulator as well as a copy of the database, uh, of a blank database. All right, so um, let me see. All right, so I give it a pod name. I'm reserving hard drive space of like 10 gigabytes, and then I choose the database I want. And in this case, we're gonna do SQL Server 2022. Okay, I get a message that the pod is created. Now, um, if this is the first time that you use this app, or um, it may take a couple minutes for the pod to be set up, but after you use it the first time, uh, okay, so it's, it's, uh, the pod is running. So now um, the pod, uh, I need to do a port forward to that pod so that I can um, set up the, so I can set up the database. So at this screen, uh, what happens is when you when you do the pod initialization, um, the database has like a default password to it. Um, so what this does is it allows you to um, change that password and add a new user at the same time. All right. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to upload the SQL script. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what that uh, SQL script looks like in just a moment. Let's see, SQL Server. All right, and then we want to set up the data source. There are two data sources that you have to set up um, whenever you want to use this tool. So you have your source database, which would be like production, and then there's a pod um, data source. So this is the database, this is the blank database that's created whenever you create the server. Uh, so if you just give me a moment, I, I've got to put this information in. So we do have a question about, do they need to set up the Kubernetes in the cloud or can they run the image in a local Docker setup on their local machine? Um, you, so you would have to use a Kubernetes, but you, you can use it. You can use a local Kubernetes cluster. Um, you don't necessarily have to use a cloud one. So there's a difference between Docker and Kubernetes. So you can't run this in Docker. You have to use Kubernetes to run it. So uh, I saved the information. Uh, did I did I answer his questions? Yes, you did. Okay.
All right, hold on one moment because let me make sure I have the everything correct. So I just tried this just a minute ago. <laughs> and of course it 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 would Let me see if I need to disconnect. Okay, I guess that's, I guess it um, didn't like me having those two connections open. This is just a dev a dev server, so that might be why it, it didn't like that. Okay, so uh, once we do that, um, I'm going to click Preview Merge. And I'm going to explain what these what these. Uh, so you have dry runs, you have Preview Merge, and Post View Merge. I'm going to explain what those are in just a moment. Um, let me pull up the um, let me pull up the SQL script that's running. Okay, so um, this is the SQL script. Uh, select star from the employees table where the SSN is one two three four five six seven eight nine. Um, the way to think about uh, how this tool works is that it it reads your SQL script and then it determines, it tries to build a test environment based off of your SQL script. Um, so the preview merge, all it does is it just, it just tries to build the environment. The post view merge will build the environment and then run your SQL script against the pod uh, or, or against the, uh, the uh, database in the pod or the virtual server. And then uh, dry run, does what the um, it sets it up, it runs the SQL script against against your database, and then it destroys itself. Um, okay. If one sec, guys. Uh, the recording seems to have stopped. Give me one sec. Sure. Oh well, it lied. So. So it does, it is still recording, right? Yeah. Okay. And you can it's actually weird. check out the transcriptions too. So, you know. Okay. Thank you. Go, go ahead, Winston. Okay. So um, now we're going to, um, so it said it said it got it, it said it set it up. So now we're going to connect um, to the, to the pod um, database. Uh, There's a question. Okay, sure. So this tool would be used by DBAs who are investigating an issue, right? There wouldn't be any users who would be allowed to view production data anyways. So thank you, Ina. Right, this would be for, for anybody. Not, um, I don't know about the DBAs only because of the, um, the work that you have to do if you if you just need to research data then yes but I, dbas do a lot more than just you know research data so um they would be the only group that would be exempt um uh, but like any developers if a user is running queries um anybody else other than dbas or uh, unless you have dbas that are just like you know uh basically they just uh, execute sql scripts in production um that sort of thing um, does that answer your question? Veena, you can just respond here. Uh, yes, yeah, she added the comment saying, yes, developers too, but mostly they will not have access to prod data, only dev data. Um, well, what they will have access to is they will have access to production data, but they will only have access to a small subset of that. 
So they so um and they will only have access to it for a limited time. So are you thinking like dev data has uh like mass data or not or not production data in it? I, I, or the person that asked the question. Uh, just saying that it's different at every company. Okay. Dev data would not have the sensitive uh, pan data, for example. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is so this was created to allow you to look at that because there there are some situations or several situations in which you can't use mass data. Uh, for example, um, you know, like if you work somewhere and you have to update like the person's name or you got to update the credit card because a batch job mangled something like you 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 have to use the production data so you you can't use mass so um so with 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 this you could just limit them to that to that one ssn across all the tables in your database and they can do their updates they can fix whatever they need to do and then you know if they don't use it after 15 minutes it destroys itself um so you you know so um so yeah i i'm hoping that answers your question or <laughs> um so i i guess i'll i'll go ahead uh with my demo here yeah. um okay yeah she said it answered okay good good all right so um as you can see um in my original query, I had the employees table. When I go to the pod and I look at the, what the um, tool created, there are actually two tables here. So we have the employees table and the payroll table. Now, the reason there are two tables is because the employees table has a foreign key to the payroll table. So um, you only had to, um, you only had to reference the employees table but the tool will create um, the other table as well as any keys associated with it. So the employees table, as you can see, only has one SSN in it. And the payroll table has the SSN, or not the SSN, but has that key associated with what was in the um, employees table. All right. So, um, Okay, so we see that it, it brought those, it, it created those tables, and and what it does as well is, when it when it creates the tables from like production, for example, it gets a copy of that DDL for production, and and copies that down to the pod. So um, because a lot of times when you have multiple database environments, the table structures can be slightly different across all those environments. And so with the way this works is that way you can make sure that you're getting how the SQL would react to that particular uh, environment. All right. Um, okay, so uh, going back to the scenario uh, number one, uh, you don't see what's causing the problem. The paycheck status on the payroll table is S, and that means his paycheck was sent. Then you remember there was another table called paycheck status you need to check out. Since there's no foreign key from the paycheck status table to the employees table, you can create an on-demand foreign key. This way, SQL Simulator will retrieve the data for that table without you needing to write a separate SQL to do it. All right, so um, let's, uh, okay, where is it? So one of the things you want to, do whenever you uh, have it do a preview merge, post view merge, or, or um, dry run, is you can do a destroy merge. And um, what that will do is just get rid of all of the tables um, that it created. And um, so if you just do destroy merge and you go back and hit refresh, okay, all those tables are gone. All right, so now what we're going to do is to create an on-demand foreign key, and I will show you the um, what that file looks like. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have it uh, run, and then I will uh, show you that file.
Okay, so um, we have the name of the database, um, the schema name, the table name, and then the column, and we have the at symbol, and then we're gonna have that match to the column, you know, the uh, fully qualified uh, name for the other uh, table that we want. So in this case, we want paycheck status uh, and employee ID. Uh, so it says the preview merge has been created. So if I go back to my, um, my database here and I hit refresh, Okay, so now we see we have three tables. We have the employee table, the payroll table, and then the paycheck status table. So let's look at the uh, paycheck status table. And when we look at the paycheck status table, it says that the status is returned to sender. So uh, even though the batch, even though it says it was sent to the person, um, it was returned. Uh, it was returned back to the company. So then we would just follow whatever processes are in place to make sure that the check goes out to the employee. All right. Are there uh, any questions so far? No additional questions. Okay, great. Okay, so the second scenario, you and another developer need to make a change to the to production database at the same time. You would like to see what happens if you run both of your SQLs against production. All right. So uh, just give me a moment to uh, set that up. So I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna get rid of that. I should have. Uh, <laughs> I should have dropped all the tables, but it's okay. We'll uh, uh, or destroyed the merge, but it's okay. We'll uh, we'll see what happens here. All right, uh, I want a post view merge. Um, let's see. So I'm going to pull up their SQLs. Okay. So developer A is doing an alter table and they're adding these two columns. Developer B is doing an insert into. Um, so we want to see what, what's going to happen if I run developer A and B SQLs. Okay. So, uh, developer A, their SQL is okay. Developer B got this error. Column name or number of supplied values does not match the table definition. Would anybody like to take a guess as to why developer A's SQL ran, but developer B's did not? Okay, um, so the reason that developer B SQL failed is because um, we changed the products table, we altered the products table, and um, we have a table called plastic products that does not have these new these two new columns. So if we if we're trying to do an insert into with a select. Um, you know, it's not going to have that. It's not going to have that updated, those updated columns on the plastic products table, and that's why that's why it failed. All right. So let's uh, let's do this. I'm going to destroy the merge. Okay. Now I'm going to try to do it in the reverse order, where I do developer B's. Developer B's SQL will run before developer A's. And we'll see if it likes that. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the next thing it was going to do is uh, to run them in reverse order here. So this will just take, hopefully it'll be done soon. So a question came in. Can he uh, can he assume this solution creates everything, including the table, the triggers referencing 
other tables, indexes with the same set options and fill factor custom statistics with the same sampling are just a filter set of data. So right now what it does is the table structure and it will do indexes. So like uh, most of the items that are on a DDL, so if you do, uh, I can't remember it right now, whatever is on the DDL, it's gonna, it's gonna create. The triggers, it does not do that yet, but that is on my roadmap. Uh, to have it do those as well. Um, now, the other thing that it does not do, um, it only does, it doesn't process uh, um, T-SQL, the logical T-SQL commands. Um, and that's more for security reasons. I haven't, I haven't figured out how to, how to deal with that yet. Um, but it does do uh, inserts, updates, delete statements, create table statements, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you did. OK. All right. So uh, as we can see, when we run it in reverse order, um, everything is OK. Now, that may that may or may not be OK. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that you know uh, everything depends on what order you run it in, if you have multiple SQL statements, I mean, um, files, right? So um, that's, just to, that's just to show you that. OK. So, um, okay, scenario number three. Uh, you got an email from HR. It was informing you of a end of year $20,000 bonus, but before it could be paid out, you had to install something on your machine. So you click on it without thinking. Uh, the link installed malware on your computer. The malware allowed the hacker to steal your database username and password. It also gave them admin rights so they could take control of your computer. Why did you fall for this scam? Did you forget they haven't given bonuses in a decade? Uh, <laughs> now we're going to pretend to be the hacker and see how much data we can steal from the database. All right. So we're going to destroy that. Um, scenario number three. And we'll do a preview merge, and I'll show you what the SQL is. OK, so now they're just trying to steal. They want to get everything out of the, um, the hack, uh, out of the employee table. All right. So we'll see. OK, so now we get sensitive data constraint violated. Tried to retrieve more than the allowed amount of three. So it would not let them retrieve uh, more than three in the database. All right, are there any uh, questions about this uh, scenario? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, just an additional question about what if there's uh, encryption on the database, if there's TDE or always encrypt present in the original database? I am not 100% sure how it will, how it will react. I have not tested that um, or, or tried that against it. Probably if something is encrypted in production and it tries to copy it, I'm assuming it will probably copy it encrypted. Um, but, I, but again, I, I, I haven't tried that particular uh, thing out or tested my tool with that uh, particular scenario. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so we can go to the audit table uh, to see who accessed the data. Let's see. So we're gonna go to the production database. I'm gonna just disconnect from there.
Okay, so um, the the tool uses basically three three tables. Um, there's um, an audit table, celebrity data table, and then constraints. So the audit table just gives you an audit of um, any of the users, um, you know, the users, and then what was the uh, constraint type. So, for example, um, you know, today I pulled um, these SSNs. Now these are, uh, I know I have like a, a limit of three, but you can pull the same three. You can only just do those those three that day. Okay, so you, you'll see multiple ones. Now there's a fourth one here that tried to get pulled, but that one did not, was not successful. All right. So, um, so yeah, so this gives you the user and then the database that they tried to access and then the constraint type there and then the date and time. Uh, let's see. So scenario number four, Tom Brady is joining the Geeko board of directors. The DBA has added him to the celebrity table. We are now going to be a sneaky, nosy employee and view his data. All right. So uh, let's see. We're going to go here, get rid of that. And... We're gonna go to the celebrity SQL. I'm gonna do a preview merge and then I'll bring up the uh, SQL that the employee tried. Okay, so the employee tried uh, select star from employees where the employee first name is Tom and the last name is Brady. And, oh, hold on one second. <laughs> Let me see if, uh, I think I gotta edit this to put it back. There's a celebrity table. I think I have to do the audit, uh, not the audit table, uh, constraints. Okay, so um, this is the constraint table. Um, this is where you would set up uh, some of your items. So like here, I've got celebrity data, and then I'm given like the fully qualified um, column name, the SSN, and then um, right now I have it set up to allow the user SS admin to um, retrieve their data, but I'm gonna remove that. And um, now, if I run this, it shouldn't let me do it. Um, this table is also where you would um, define things, uh, like I said, like your sensitive data. So uh, this first this first value is SSN. Um, this is just like the, the name for the sensitive data. So you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be SSN. It could be credit card, it could be bank account information, it could be whatever you want. You you know, you just want to make sure that you name it that way. Um, okay. So now when you run this, you get celebrity data was returned by your SQL. Please modify your SQL or get approval to review. Um, so um, let me see, is there anything else here? Are there any any questions about the uh, celebrity data um, or this last scenario? Not at this time. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so that was um, so that's the end of the demo portion of the um, of the SQL Simulator. Are there um, any questions that people have? Like. Um, would you like, because we, we have a little bit of time left, uh, I can go into a little bit more in depth of, you know, like Docker and Kubernetes, um, uh, maybe go into depth more on, you know, uh, we can go into depth a little bit more on the, um, let's see, on the different, uh, you, you know, like exactly what uh, the preview, preview merge, post view merge, and dry run, like, it, you know, like, give you a visual of how all that works, um, 
or would you guys like to just kind of end it today? <laughs> you know, however you guys want to do it. Uh, there's a question about how the to get the tool. Okay. Yes. So um, you can get it uh, by going to my website. Oh, let me put let me put this up. Uh, and the next question said, "Yes, please walk us through." Okay. Sure. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you'd like to try it out, um, you can install it for 30 days for free. Um, since you, uh, since you guys came to the, um, since you guys joined the demo today, if you just email my support, uh, support at tribalknowledge.tech with the subject line SQL Sim free. Um, you can get, um, you can run one copy of it for free for a year. Um, um, and I also do one-on-one -on -one consultation. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with Kubernetes, um, then, you know, I can walk you through like the whole thing of how to set it all up and everything like that. And it doesn't cost anything. Um, and then, um, so my website is called tribalknowledge.tech. My email address, and I can give this information um, to you, Julie, and you can send it out to everybody um, as well in an email. And then you can, here's my phone number, uh, but I would say just text me first if you're gonna call, if you wanna talk to me on the phone, uh, because we all get a bunch of, you know, um, we all get a bunch of spam calls and stuff. <laughs> so I won't pick up unless you leave a message or you know you text me and let me know, hey, I, I, was, I, I, I was part of your presentation and I wanted to talk with you, okay. So that's how you get it. So. Um, on my website, uh, on the documentation, so I'll just I'll just take you to the website. Uh, I'll try and... uh, of course, I misspelled my own website. Uh, let me go here. All right, so this is the website. Um, you go to products and then um, documentation, uh, or you can go to the install guide. Uh, but the install guide just takes you directly to uh, the documentation page. Um, so uh, there's a variety of ways you can install it. Um, the person that asked about the install, are you familiar with Kubernetes or are you um, unfamiliar with it? Kind of sort of like. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, like for the Azure, for example, um, and let me let me go ahead and do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna kill my sessions here. So uh, we'll just say, um, in order to install it, you've got to have the Azure CLI, you've got to install kubectl, and then you have to set up an AKS cluster, and and that's uh, it's called AKS in um, Azure. Uh, it's called you know, different things than, you know, depending on the cloud provider, okay? And um, all you need to do is download this file, all right? And this file is a YAML, it contains YAML, um, and I'll show you that. Uh, let's see, we want... Okay, so this is the YAML. Um, this contains the location of the image, and um, this is for the control panel. So all you need to do in order to install it is to um, run this command, uh, kubectl apply minus f sscp.yaml. And that installs, that will install the SQL simulator tool on your Kubernetes cluster, all right? Um, so there, there are instructions up here for each of the, you know, the different providers, or if you want to do on-prem Kubernetes, um, I have on any of these, if you want help or if something goes wrong, please reach out to me, um, and I will help you. 
um, with that. There are also some Hello World tutorials that go through uh, how to set how to set everything up. Um, now, I think uh, somebody may have wanted um, uh, a technical overview of like the post view merge, preview, preview merge, and, and that sort of thing. So I will uh, go through that here in the next uh, couple minutes. Um, is this so? Th uh, this is a documentation on the on um, my um, website. Is this is this screen large enough uh, for you to see uh, this this image? Yes, I can see it. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, step step. So we're gonna go through the post view merge. Okay. So the step one would be uh, this yellow portion here is your SQL script. Uh, this is a very simple script. Um, so we're trying to update an employee table, and we want to set the type equals to R, where the employee employee ID is one. Okay. And so the step one is that the tool will go into the SQL file and it will pick up. Anything that is a um, anything that's a table. Now, uh, um, probably most people have not done static code analysis. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, like it, whenever um, so, there's a tool I use called Antler uh, behind the scenes that basically does these. It creates a abs uh, something called an abstract syntax tree. So when it when it's um, so when it's using when it's when it's looking at your uh, SQL file, it breaks apart your SQLs um, so that I so that my tool can pick up. Okay, this is a table, this is a column. You're doing a set here. Like it it tells me how to read your SQL file so that I can pick out your tables and, and things of that nature. All right. Um, so the first thing it does is the static code analysis. Then this next step is that it goes to your production database and then it gets a copy of the DDL for the table. Um, and then there's a note here, if there are any tables that are linked by a foreign key reference, it will retrieve the DDLs for those automatically. So you don't have to, you don't have to do all that, all right? So step three is it will um, create that table inside of the pod or the virtual server. All right, and um, the next step is uh, it's going to copy the data. So um, again, we have the update statement, and SQL Simulator will convert that over to a select statement. Um, And let me see if this is the one that has it. Okay, it doesn't talk about that here. Okay, so um, when it when it converts to a select star from employee, um, that is how um, there's there's also a data governor here. There's not that's not in this image, um, but when but when and this is why I don't process T SQL yet or T SQL logical statements. Or procedural, I'm sorry, the the procedural language. So um, because you know a hacker or or anybody could hide um, the name of the columns, right? So if I have a column named SSN, you can select and then you know change the um, alias for that column, and that's difficult. You know that'd be impossible for my tool to pick it up. So regardless of what type of of um, SQL statement you do. My tool forces it, it basically forces its own um, select statement to make sure that it can always pick up a SSN, a credit card field, you know, whatever, whatever type of field you need it to pick up, it'll pick that up. So, uh, and then it, and, and so in, in this step, um, you have your select statement that it goes to production, gets those values, and then copies them. And then as long as it meets the criteria for the, um, audit the data governance, it will copy it into the database pod. Now, uh, I do want to I, I do want to mention that if you don't have anything selected in your where clause, it's going to copy all the records in that table. Um, but there are some things you can do to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, um, 
uh, there are some other keys. There are some other values you can set inside the governor to like, if you want to say, okay, force everybody to have a where clause. Then anybody that runs anybody that tries to run a SQL against inside SQL simulator against your database, they will always have to put a where clause. Okay, and then the last step is to um, take your update statement and run it inside of the pod. All right. And so uh, the, the preview merge is basically the same thing as the post view merge, except for it doesn't do uh, step number five, which is to run your SQL against the database pod. And um, like I mentioned with the dry run, um, it does everything that the post view merge does. And then the last step is uh, it destroys all the objects in the database pod. Um, are there any other questions, or have I thoroughly confused everybody? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that, but just a quick thing. Uh, four minutes to go. Time check. Yeah, thanks, Prash. Right, okay. All right, cool. So um, are there are there any other questions that I can answer for folks? Okay, if not, then um, the floor is, uh, floor is yours, Julie. I want to thank everybody for um, um, giving me a chance to present today. And um, I hope that you were able to uh, get uh, something from the presentation today. Thank you very much, Weston. Uh, just let people know, yes, this was recorded and uh, I'll be uploading it to our YouTube uh, channel uh, by the end of this week. And thank you again for a very interesting and different uh, presentation. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. to stop